Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 337 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and oh my gosh, I'm so thrilled that you're here with me today as I'm talking to Jasmine Guillory. I've wanted her on the show for a very long time, and today is the day. You're going to love this episode. We talk about handwriting your first draft, something I'm still going to do someday. We talk about explaining problems to somebody else so that you can help figure it out. Even if they don't actually help you, you figure it out yourself. It's that magic of talking to somebody else. We also talk about the magic of giving yourself grace and the reminder that nobody's going to die from this stuff. Uh, it was just a fantastic talk. You're going to love it. Please stay tuned for that after a little bit of an update about what's going on around here. What is going on around here? I am back. Wait, no, I think I talked to you last week after our tramp to the Able Tasman. Uh, I'm sure I did. It was fantastic. I'm still not, re I'm not recovering. Honestly, I am just happy to be home. I'm excited about moving to our house and absolutely freaking out about time. I'm looking at the calendar in front of me right now. And I have two weekends in which I can get my moving done because uh, one weekend I will be out of town at a little writer's retreat up in the middle of the North Island with some of my besties. So that's going to be great, but there'll be no packing happening during that Plus, between now and the move, I am about to open my classes, starting the classes. I have missed teaching so much for the last three months that I took off. Um, sometimes I take off three months, sometimes I only take off one month. One month might be better because three months I start to get itchy. I start to get scratchy. I miss helping people boots on the ground right. I mean, I hope that I help you all every week with this podcast. Um, but I also like to really get down into the dirt and the pain and the angst of writing books. So I'm very glad that that is starting back up next week, first week of the year. Let's see what else. I just went for my first swim of the season in um, an outdoor pool. However, I have jumped into the harbor twice. No, wait, three times this week. Was it three times this week? I think so. On Christmas day itself, we met a couple friends downtown and had a little picnic outside because obviously it's summer here. It's turning into summer, summer, summertime. And there's this little pier out by the beach that we like to go to downtown. And the kids are always jumping off of it. All over Wellington, there are places for people to jump into bodies of water, like right downtown, there is a little tower structure that you can climb up and just jump through and into the water. The uh, Kiwis have never met a thing that they were scared of or that they wanted to gatekeep. If you want to throw yourself off that mountain, they will absolutely clap as you go down. And uh, these kids were jumping off the end of the pier and I always watch them, but I don't like heights. I um, one of the only things I'm scared of is, is heights. Well, that's not true. I'm scared of everything, but my only kind of phobia that doesn't really make sense is heights. I don't like them. I will do them. I will go across bridges. Not a problem. My pilot father-in-law has a real fear of heights and he won't even go across bridges, but he is a pilot. Uh, apparently that's not uncommon for pilots. He said, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm going off track anyway. So I always go to the end of this pier while I'm in my swimsuit. And I always think, nope, that's like a high dive. I think I may have done one high dive in my whole kid life. And, but these kids were there and I was there and I was in my togs and they were jumping. And I asked this one little boy, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12. I said, do you want to do it with me? Can you jump with me? And he's like, nah, you got this. And I said, okay, but, but how do you do it? He's like, you just run real fast and you jump. And he must've seen my face. And he said, or you could just do what I do sometimes and walk off. And so I just walked off. Lala was filming the whole thing as I was trying to get the nerve to do it. And then I just turned around and I walked off and it was awesome. And I've been in the water a couple of times since um, for very short swims. The water out there is really warming up. Although the only place I really went in for a swim was on the straight side of Wellington. So kind of facing the Cook Strait where it was cold and I didn't swim for very long. But today I went down to the local pool and I had my first swim and there were a bunch of us having our first outdoor swims today. And it was awesome. And I'm really feeling 
summer come in and land and I'm so happy that it is here. And I am so sorry if you have been going through the cold and hopefully me talking about the warmth and the summer that is going to come to you at some point will help. I know that a lot of a lot of the states in Canada have been really, really pelted with huge storms. And I am sending you warm, warm, warm thoughts about that. Uh, what else has been going on? I have been, oh, I've been wrapping up my Patreon essay for this month. And I want to encourage you, if you're not a member of my Patreon, I send out these essays once a month. I really love writing them. And this one is about our tramp in Abel Tasman. And it includes me talking about my fear of heights uh, because both me and my wife, Lala, had to face our biggest phobias. Um, and well, I guess our other biggest phobia is the dentist. And there was there were no dentists there, as far as I could tell. But I had to do a bunch of stuff with heights that felt very risky to me. And poor Lala had to walk by a lot of bees and through two swarms of wasps. So uh, I talk about that in the Patreon. And I talk about how sometimes walking through the hard stuff is what makes what's on the other side so sweet. And I know it's a cliche, but it's real and it's true. And I love writing these essays. So if you would like to get a look at those, uh, you can always join for a dollar a month and then read all of the essays. There's more than 50 over there. And then unsubscribe. I don't mind if you want to join for $5 a month and then unsubscribe next month because you can't afford it. You can always go in and go out. That is always, always fine. Speaking of Patreon, I have not thanked new patrons in a while because I sometimes forget to do this and I want to start doing this and hopefully I remember because sometimes I say I'm going to start doing things and then my little brain just forgets, but I want to wish things for new patrons and current patrons. If you want to wish, send me an email and let me know and I will read it on the air or you can unsubscribe and then resubscribe again. <laughs> whatever you would like to do. But here is a little bumper crop of uh, maybe a month or two of uh, Patreon subscribers, new patrons. You can always find this over at Rachel, sorry, patreon.com slash Rachel. And uh, so Cheryl Sevy, who upped her pledge. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I wish for you the ease of an extra 30 minutes every day found out of nowhere, out of the clear blue sky. Jen Outland, thank you. I wish for you a blue sky that takes your breath away with its pure goodness. Dharma Kelleher, hello Dharma. I wish for you the prettiest, sparkliest boots the world has ever seen. When people watch you walk by, they cannot help but gasp. And Susan Levitan, who upped her pledge. Thank you, Susan. I wish for you the excitement and giddiness of a roller coaster with none of the fear or the spine jolting, just sheer fun. Dahlia Constantine, who also upped her pledge. Thank you, Dahlia. I wish for you that you will see him whenever you want to. And I know you know what that means. Uh, Cindy Aurora. What a pretty name. I wish for you the joy that comes from getting the biggest, fattest Crayola box in which they are all sharp and ready to color. You can basically smell that wax and feel the color going down onto the page and those crayons never unsharpen. Uh, Noreen Stone, I wish for you secret butterflies that only you can see. And last but never least, AK Mulford Alley. I wish for you peace and clean sheets and easy, sweet focus that lets you write 60,000 words in two or three days. And it doesn't even felt like you wrote 2K. That is my wish for you, all of my friends. Thank you. Um, that was fun. I think I'm going to keep doing that. And so I want to remember to read a review every once in a while. And this, I just went over and they're so hard for me to find the reviews over there. I don't even know where to look. This one comes from Sci-Fi Righto. And it came in last Tuesday and it says, I uh, love this podcast. Rachel has created an important and comforting window to the process of writing with this podcast. I'm a longtime listener and still with every guest, I learned something new and helpful. It's also fun to follow her journey through this career. That's awesome. Thank you, Sci-Fi Righto. And also I love that you use the word comforting. I always want to tell the truth about writing, but I also want to comfort y'all about the hard stuff because there's some hard stuff in writing and you know that, and I'm never going to sugarcoat that. However, I will give you sugar 
after I tell you about it. I promise that. Um, so that's all happening. I feel like there's not much more to tell you. Um, yeah, so let's just jump into the interview and tell you a little bit about Jasmine, who is awesome. Jasmine Guillory is a New York Times bestselling author. Her novels include The Wedding Date, the, Reese, the Reese's Book Club selection, The Proposal, and By the Book. Her work has appeared in The Wall Street Journal, Cosmopolitan, Bon Appetit, and Time, and she's a frequent book contributor on the Today Show. She lives in my old hometown of Oakland, California, and Drunk on Love is her most recent release. Please enjoy this interview with Jasmine, and I wish you, my friends, very happy writing as we move into this new year, which is going to be the best writing year any of us have ever had. I can feel it. Can you feel it? I can feel it. Let's go do this. Well, I am so pleased to welcome you to the show today. Will you please share your name with us and your pronouns? Absolutely. My name is Jasmine Guillory and my pronouns are she, her. I have been looking forward to this so much. We did an event a million and a half years ago at a Which library. seems even longer ago because the pandemic was in between. Oh yes. my goodness. <laughs> and you live in my old hometown of Oakland I and do. I have been following, following the, the your stratospheric rise <laughs> and enjoying all of your books. And I'm just so happy to have you here, Jasmine. Yay. Oh, well, I it's feel- a thrill. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, uh, phew, yes. Mm-hmm. Will you please, because this is a show about writing process, will you please tell us about your writing process, how you get all the books done? Where does it fit in your life? All of it. You know, I mean, I will say like it has been a little different for every book, right? Mm. Um, both because I think for a few things, right? Because each book, you're kind of in a different place in your mind, but then each book, you're in a different place, like in the world, right? So my my first three published novels I wrote while I was working full-time um as a lawyer and so I wrote like I wrote my first uh book The Wedding Date um as part of um NaNoWriMo it was the um April you know because I didn't even know until I did The Wedding Date in April that they had other months than just November and so they also do April and July and a friend of mine had asked like at the end of March, you know, knew I was writing and was like, "Are do you want to do April NaNoWriMo, another friend, another friend are, are doing it together. And it's sort of like, you're in a little cabin. And I was like, sure, like, I'll be in your imaginary cabin. Cause I had had the idea for the wedding date, but I hadn't really committed myself to writing it yet. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so I think that was like at the very end of March, she texted me about that. And so I like, kind of went to my not quite an outline jotted notes down and like made a quick outline and then dove in and so that one I wrote like I would bring my laptop to work with me and like went across the street to the Starbucks at lunchtime would write for 30 minutes at lunch um after work I would write for you know another hour or two um and wrote that first draft very quickly like the I wrote the first 50 thousand words of it in that month. And then I finished, I mean, I, I kept working on it, but not quite as fast Mm -hmm. um, after that, but I finished that first draft in like two and a half months um, and then spent a long time revising it. And my other, you know, my, the proposal and the wedding party, I also wrote while I was writing, while I was working full time, though not quite as fast. Like I would, you know, I would write them at home at night. I'm, I am a night person, not a morning ah. person. Um, so I would always like kind of get home from work, make dinner and then take a little break and then write. Um, but then when I started writing full time, I, for a while, I was still just writing at night. And I was like, Jasmine, you had all day. Like, why is it nine o'clock and you're opening your laptop now? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I've had to really, I mean, I've always, partly I think I've always been a night owl, but also I yeah. got so used to just writing at night that that's what I would just do. And I was like, maybe you can do something different now <laughs> that you have a different schedule. So I had to kind of force a different schedule on myself. Um, and so some books I have sort of, written faster or slower, kind of depending on what's going on. Like, um, you know, Royal Holiday, I wrote relatively quickly. Um, The first draft, I kind of went into that NaNoWriMo mode again and, you know, dove into that first draft, but then did a longer revision. 
Um, and then with with Drunk on Love, I wrote this book. So th this was my my longest book, number one. And number two, I wrote the entire first draft by hand. What? I know. Oh, I did it. Goodness. I also did it. So I did the same thing with While We Were Dating, which is my sixth book, which was the, I started writing that book in May of 2020. And as you may remember, there was a lot that we were all going through in yeah. that time of 2020. And so I had planned to start writing it in the middle of March, I had had like, I was like, okay, I was going to a writing retreat. Um, I was like the guest in residence at a writing retreat. I was like, this is perfect timing. I will outline it then, you know, cause I had general ideas for the book. I was like, I'll give myself an outline then and I'll start writing on an April 1st. I tend to like give myself deadlines to start, you know? Mm -hmm. And then of course everything fall, fell apart yeah. in March. And I was like, this is not, this is not <laughs> happening. So finally I was like, well, I, I need to do something that's not like, in like curling up in the fetal position um and like scrolling twitter to see what terrible thing is happening next so i guess i i'll just start writing something I, it's not a book I, I can't write a book right now I'll just start writing something so it felt like you know i'm just writing in a notebook like writing oh a notebook gosh. is different it's not like like an, a laptop is where work happens a notebook is just where things happen and so that was sort of my way of convincing myself to start writing oh um gosh. and then eventually I was like all right I guess it's a book I'll start typing this up so I'm sort of writing and typing simultaneously but I was always be behind on the typing and so um, how does it, so tell me how that uh, Rachel Housel Hall has a similar process with her thrillers and and like do you t tell me how that works with I love details like do you Right, 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 right. And then type some up or do you write the whole thing or like what, what ended up happening? So I've done it twice. I never write the, the whole thing and type up because that, that would just be, be madness, that would be terrible. right? <laughs> um, so each time, I, like, because I sort of once I was like, all right, because neither time, first of all, neither time did I intend to write the entire thing by hand. Um, <laughs> with while you're we dating, I, because I always... Uh, uh, do I always, I think every time I've written like the very beginning of a book by hand, because it's a, I feel like a lot of writing is just tricking yourself into mm -hmm. doing it. And so it, like, I hate a, a blank word document. So it's like, all right, I'm going to write the first, like, I don't know, 500,000 words by hand, and then I'll type it up and then boom, it's not blank anymore. I have a beginning of a book and I'll keep typing. And so that's, I think what I, I mean, that's definitely what I had initially planned to do with while we were dating, but it was like, I can't start typing now. That seems stressful. I'm not going to do that. And then when I eventually was like, okay, fine, I will start typing. You know, I was behind, you know, I was probably at least a month behind. So, and I type obviously a lot faster than I write. So I could catch up faster, but it was, yeah. I was still pretty behind. And so my plan had always been like, well, I will eventually catch up and then just sort of keep typing when I catch up. But then I, I started getting to the end of the notebook and I was like, <laughs> no, what am I going to do? I'm towards the end of this notebook, but I haven't caught up yet. Like, how am I going to do this? And then I was, and then it took me a little while, but I was like, Jasmine, you can just buy another notebook. Like, Two ninety nine. <laughs> because I mean, and, and obviously I'm a writer. I have a million. Yeah, you don't need to buy one. I know you don't. But I needed, <laughs> needed another one of the exact same notebook. You see, I need oh, the exact same we understand. Yeah. So, so, so I, just, so I went out and bought another one of the exact same notebook and then what writing. kind of notebook is it? Nerd, nerd uh, out, I, nerd I, out on me. Because I, I love those, I love those pale colored composition books. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. <gasps> one of these. So, so it's, it's a Cam it's Cambridge. Cambridge Limited, and it's uh, for people book. listening. Hard. It's a yeah. hardcover, which is very helpful because it like, yeah. it, you know, it has. It feels like you're writing on a sort of tablet. Oh, I love that, and it's spiral bound and black. It's spiral bound, and the pages are really long, like they're eight and a half by eleven pages. Um, and so that that felt like hefty enough, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so both, I mean, and, and the two books that I have written completely by hand, at least the first draft, I have written in these exact same notebooks because they feel like good writing notebooks for some reason. I don't know. Other notebooks are like note taking notebooks, some are journals, <laughs> you know, you can I, feel it. When I, you know, the notebook, I you know so well. Notebook. How much, how much editing happens between in, in, 
in that small space between the typed page and your fingers putting it into the computer? I mean, this is the problem. Like this is <laughs> why this is why it was there was so much good, unfortunately, about writing by hand because a lot of editing does happen, but it doesn't. It's like, because once I type it up, it's sort of draft one and a half. Yeah. So it's not quite a second draft, but it also, there's a lot of tiny editing that happens. But I feel like for me, the most important thing is that it caused me to keep thinking about it. And so I would realize oh, yeah. that there were things that I sort of kept repeating in different scenes that I hadn't realized or that I didn't quite know I kept thinking about. And that made me wonder, like, why do I keep saying that? What am I? Oh, oh, well, that's it. You know, or when there are things that I, because there's always like kind of things that I know weren't quite working and I'm not sure how to fix. And so typing them up made me realize like, this is what's wrong with it. Because the first step is always figuring out what's wrong with it. Because sometimes it's just like, it feels wrong, but I don't know what I don't it have is. No idea. Why. Yeah. And so, so figuring that out, you know, sometimes I would still type up the whole scene, even though I knew there was something wrong with it, because I'm just sort of figuring that out. And then I was like, oh, something's wrong with that. And but then sort of I keep going, you know, because I'm still I'm still handwriting way ahead of what I'm typing. And then you know, after a few days, I kind of figure out what's right. And so then I can kind of change mid course in what yes. I'm writing and, and, and start, you know, figure out the new plot line or the new storyline or whatever. And so I feel like a lot of work happens in there, even if it's not, even if it's not quite visible on the page, like I can feel the difference. That's beautiful. You're reacting to what you have thought yeah. And it's actually, you're doing it on the fly. You're literally doing it on, on the fly. That's so yeah. cool. What yeah. is your, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> writing, <laughs> that's my okay. answer. Yeah. I mean, I think, but I, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is just like physically making myself do it. Right. Yeah. Which is actually one of the reasons that I, when I'm working on a project, make myself write every day. Um, because, because I, because I have like, having that daily thing, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I have to do it. Um, it really just keeps me doing it over and over and over again, because I'm a procrastinator at heart. And so if I don't write for a day, it's like, oh, well, it's so hard to get back into it or like, but I have so much to make up for. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just miss one more day. And then it just feels like this huge thing. Yes. Whereas if it's like, you know what, look, I just have to do a little bit just a little bit. Um, often that's enough to convince myself to either do a lot or I will just do a little bit and it's fine, but it still keeps it kind of the, the people and the story alive in my head. I love, I love that. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? I think those, the biggest joys are those moments when I am trying to figure something out and like, I've been wrestling with the problem in my head for days and kind of brainstorming about it and nothing feels like it works. And then like, I figure it out. Like, and, and it really does feel like there is a light bulb that goes on. Like, yes, that is it. That is the answer. And it just like, those are the times when I feel like I could, you know, lift up a car. Yes. <laughs> right. Like, like the euphoria, the right. Yes. That floods yeah. through us that nobody yeah. else could really understand, but it's yeah. so good. It, yeah. It feels so great. Oh, oh yeah. I wish we could channel it. Can you yeah. share a craft tip of any sort with us? Yeah, I think for me, for me, the biggest thing is character. Um, and so figuring out your way into a character is the most important thing. Um, and I am always like, I feel like there's, there's a, a like kind of dichotomy between like the plotsers and the pantsers, right? Mm -hmm. The people who have an outline people but but I think so many of us are like in the middle yeah. um because I definitely I, I definitely used to be a person who was like I have to have an outline and abide by the outline but I always have an outline but there's a lot of room for wiggle you know there's a lot of wiggle yeah. room in between and so I feel like what has really helped me is not forcing myself to be so 
like so fixed in what I want or who I am as a writer and what I need and and learn to figure things out on the fly um I also feel like I think so many writers relate to this the you know when you are like trying to like describe a problem to another writer like to help them give you an idea and often just the yes process of describing it to them helps you and so sometimes I have done that like I started an email to like actually this happened with me with Drunk on Love like I my my editor like wanted to you know we were trying to figure out a title we did not have a title for it and so I was like sort of still in the process of writing the first draft and I was trying to describe what the book was like to um you know my my editor my publishing team and just like writing about it, I could see that there was like a something missing. And I was like, oh, what is it that's missing? And so I was like, started like sending an email to a friend about like, this is what, and then I was like, oh, oh, well, <laughs> never mind. That's it. And so I think that is one thing that I Gosh. have like used in other times is try to de- try to describe your story to someone. I mean, I think, you know, people talk about the querying process and, you know, how writing a query is difficult. And sometimes it's right, it's right difficult because there is something missing in your story. Yeah. And so like going through that process for yourself, you, you know, at kind of every p- part of the story and trying to describe like, what are the, what is the key question of your book for yourself and for all of your main characters? Like, if you can't answer that question, oh, well then, okay, then you need to answer it. And sometimes it's right there in the story, but you just haven't figured it out yet. And so trying to figure that out is, is really important and tells you a lot. I love that. I I love that you're describing this so clearly. And this is something that I know that I, I'm kind of cruel to myself in a lot of ways. And I, and I cheat on this idea. I cheat with this idea while I'm writing my books. A lot of times I will write my log line or, you know, like the premise for the book, but I'll know it's, I'll know it's weak and yeah. not good enough. Um, but the minute I have to describe it to somebody else, whether it's in an email to an editor or to, you know, even to my wife, like I, that's when I hear it. And, um, yeah. and, and a couple of my friends and I in, in Oakland would always have, we, what we called plot lunch and we would call it like i need a plot lunch i need a plot lunch and then we would go usually to um merit bakery r.i.p oh. <sighs> and we would sit in those booths and the one person would describe and we would just listen and they would get stuck and they would know where we would get stuck and then we would throw them ideas and they would say no that's not the idea you know and it's one of those things where we don't get offended because the other the other person's probably not gonna have the right idea but we know right. what's wrong exactly yes i love that yeah like I, with, um, there are two other writers that I have had a few writing retreats with. And so we, we do it very well because we sort of will like rent a house where we each have our own bedroom and then all day we each kind of work on and off. And so we like, we always go to the grocery store in advance, get lots of lunch food so people can kind of make lunch and breakfast separately. And then at dinner time, we come together to like kind of talk about what we're working on, invent about it and ask for ideas. And we, and often like, there's just like lots of weird brainstorming, but there's always something that's super helpful in those times and in those moments. And it's that like, no, no, no. Oh, those moments are really what is so important. Oh, that's gorgeous. I just got yeah. back from a, a retreat uh, two days ago. I had two nights oh, this week with some exactly. friends and the exact same thing. And we do the same thing. Breakfast and lunch, forage in the kitchen is stocked. And then somebody cooks dinner and then you settle down and the rest yeah. of the night is talking about writing. Yeah. May I ask you, what is the most mortifying moment that you have survived as a writer? Okay. <laughs> I love your face. (laughs) (laughs) There was a, um, like one of the first big, um, book festivals that I went to, um, like, I think it was was the Texas book festival. There were all, I was on a panel with like all of these writers who I knew of. And like, I, you know, was like so excited to be on this panel. And as we were, and I had like, it was my first panel of the day of the festival. And I had another one the next day. And then like, I had another book event a few days later. And so as we were walking out of the panel and the other writers were talking about like what other panels they were going to go see next and all of that. And I was like, oh yeah. And I felt something, 
poking at me. And I was like, oh, what is this? And I realized that the underwire of my bra had like ex exploded from my bra as we uh, many of us have experienced this happening and was like poking me in the chest. Luckily, I was wearing a pretty high neck dressed so like nobody else could see but I knew exactly what was happening and I also knew in that moment that I'd only packed one bra <laughs> for this trip and so I was like uh-huh um I think I uh I'm gonna run I have to run back to, my, to the hotel just for a minute and so like I go back to the hotel and I'm frantically googling like where to buy bra Austin <laughs> I'm like, get in a lift, go to this bra place. And I'm like, this is the situation. <laughs> this me. is an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> like, bought two bras from them and went back. Cause, but yeah. Because and that and the thing that, you know, if if one doesn't wear a bra and is listening to this podcast, what you might not understand is like when you go to an event like that, you only pack the best bra because there's only one yeah. that is gonna right. work right. Yeah. All the other bras in the closet are just, you know, trash. Yes. That's the one and it broke. Yeah. Universe. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I love that story. Thank you. <laughs> what is the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you in your writing career? Um, so this was a few months before the wedding tape came out. And there was another writer who she and I had followed each other on Twitter for a long time. I loved her books. You know, she followed me back in like months before and I hadn't even known why. Um, Tyari Jones, who's wonderful. Oh yeah. Oh my God. And, yes. it, and she and I had the same publication date um, for like the wedding date was coming out. Her next book was coming out. And so she like, sent me a D we were talking about something on Twitter and then she sent me a TM like you know what are you doing for your book she knew it was my debut what are you doing for your book where is it sending you and so like we were typing back and forth stuff and she was giving me advice and she was like you know what I'm because it was relatively late at night and she was like you know what I'm tired of typing here's my phone number call me and so I called her and we had this long conversation. She gave me all of this advice. I wrote it all down. Oh my God. And I, I, you know, and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm not, I was talking about this yet, but like, cause Target had picked my book for one of their book clubs. And I told her about that. And she was like, oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. I have stuff going on too that I'm not allowed to talk about. Hers was Oprah. Hers was <laughs> Oprah had picked her pick, her book for her book club. Oh my God. Still spending all of this time. Like I found this out, you know, months later. I, she was still spending all this time talking to me and giving me advice. And it was just so kind and like so helpful. And I still like, I'm so touched by it to this day. And you will never forget that moment. You'll never yeah, forget those yeah. words. And yeah. oh, that is, yeah. it's, I love that. What yeah. is the kindest thing that you've ever done for yourself as a writer? You know, I think just to give myself grace um, for in the hard times, like I think it is, so easy to beat ourselves up about like all of the things you got wrong or all of the things that that didn't work or or that you're struggling with and so I think just like thinking oh, okay I have time like I can do this again mm -hmm. or like this isn't nothing about writing is an emergency yeah. like I yeah. if yeah. I need to if I need more time on this deadline or if I mean more time for that like it is okay and so to like tell I mean even like I you know at the be I mean because I knew at the beginning of the pandemic that I had a deadline looming for my next book and I told my agent I think I emailed her like once a month for the first like four months of the pandemic like I'm not gonna make this deadline she was like that's okay that's all right um and then I ended up making it I think partly because I took the pressure off of myself like I was like I'm not gonna make the deadline that is fine I'm just gonna write what I need you know and I think that's partly also yeah. why I wrote by hand like I'm just yeah. gonna write something to help me get through this um because this is such a hard time this is this book is just for me I don't you know, it, it's not really a book. I'm just writing in my notebook. And, and so like, I think taking that pressure off of myself made me write something that I really loved and really cared about. And, and it made me not stress about it and not be anxious about it and just like do something for, because I, you know, I started writing because I loved it and because it brought me joy and it kind of brought me back to that during a really hard time. What you did was, uh, was fantastic because you could have just ignored that voice 
and kept beating yourself to make the deadline and end up at the finish line. And you would not have gotten the book that you got from it. Um, and I, and I have this theory that some of us who come from high pressure industries and move into writing full time, we really, like I, I was at the fire department for so long and answering 911 and every single call was an emergency, you know, it's a heart attack. It's a, and I had such a hard time deprogramming myself to realize nobody's going to die. If I spell this wrong, if I say this clumsily, nobody gets hurt. And I've seen this in a lot of lawyers too, because being a lawyer is so high intensity and, so, yeah. and it's all about speed and as fast as you can move. How was that transition for you when you left that behind? Cause you know what, how many lawyers become writers? So many, Oh my God, so it's, many. it's like the lawyer so to writer pipeline. It really is. Yeah. So how, how did you make that transition? Oh, I mean, it, it was very difficult. I think, I think it's hard to just know, you know, just in little things like little but also big things like having you know be as a writer there's no real structure in your day other yeah. than what you invent for yourself and I'm a person who needs that structure and so like going from a ton of structure to none I was like I'm falling apart here like how do I do any of this and so I think kind of figuring out what works for me and what doesn't building that structure for myself and then also like having someone, I mean, thank goodness for my agent and my publishing team who could tell me like, this is not an emergency, like it is okay. <laughs> and and I think that's something, you know, uh, talking of other kind things, like something my editor said to me pretty early on, because like she was talking about another writer of hers who was like having a big problem with writer's block. And, and she was like, and if that, like, if that ever happens to you, if there's any, anything like it is okay. Just tell me, take your time. Like that is the most important thing. Like you're the most, and I think that's also mm -hmm. what kind of gave me, made me feel like I could take that time for myself and made me feel like I could take the pressure off of myself, yeah. um, is having someone, cause she had said that to me years before, you know, I, I ever did that, but like, I kept that in my mind and yeah. I feel like that was a really essential thing. Who's your editor there? Um, Cindy, who's just wonderful, Cindy Wong. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. She's, she's amazing. amazing. How many times have I seen her on this stage accepting awards for her authors yeah. or standing <laughs> next to them? That's amazing. Yeah. What? Okay. What is the best book that you have read recently and why did you love it? Um, I recently finished On the Rooftop by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. Um, I finished it the other day and then like the the night before it was announced as the newest Reese Book Club pick, which I'm delighted by. Um, it is set in San Francisco in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. It's about a black mom and her three daughters who she has sort of trained, who are now in their 20s, but she's trained since childhood to be uh, a singing group. And, but, you know, and that's what she wants for them. But each of them has different desires and so it's sort of about all four of them kind of figuring out what they want out of life and their paths in life um and it is just like I love kind of stories about family and the complicated family relationships and um and this really is about that and you really learn to like love and care about each of these women even when they're hurting one another and I I loved it so much my core story is the mother-daughter relationship. And I would say my second core story is the sister relationship. So everything yeah. you just said is catnip and I'm just going to go. Oh, you'll it. love it. So yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking about amazing books, this uh, podcast won't come out for a little bit and your new book will be live by then. Will you please tell us a little bit about Drunk on Love? Yes. Um, so Drunk on Love is set in Napa Valley. It's about Margot and Luke. Um, Margot is the owner of a small family winery in Napa. She owns it with her brother, Elliot. Um, and one night she has just come back from a business trip. She has, goes to her best friend's bar. She's having drinks at the bar and starts chatting with the guy sitting next to her. Um, his name is Luke. They have a great conversation. They talk for hours. They go back to his place. Um, they have a lovely one night stand or so Margot thinks um, until the next morning when she is at work and who shows up um, as her next employee at her winery, but Luke, who was hired by her brother when she was out of town. And so they have to <laughs> negotiate their new relationship as boss and employee when they 
had a, a beginnings of a different relationship before and the book is how they figure that out which is such a delicious trope the 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 boss surprise but you've subverted it with swapping the genders <laughs> and it's oh give me give me please i cannot wait okay. <laughs> where can we find you online um you can find me at on instagram at jasmine picks um i'm on twitter at the best jasmine and i'm on facebook at um, Jasmine Guillory Writer. And if you go to my website, that's jasminegillory.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. And oh, your newsletter is fantastic, by the way. And oh, everybody go sign much. up because Jasmine gives amazing recipes too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for Jas for being here, Jasmine. It's been a delight to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I had a great time talking to you.